Tonight's Torah portion is one of the toughest Torah portions to teach on. And it's a very, very difficult portion because the material that's in tonight's Torah portion is very, uh, how should I say, it is very profound, <laughs> profound and powerful. Um, back, I think it was in 20, 20, 2014, somewhere there, maybe 2012, Barack Obama, uh, pre former President Barack Obama, he, he slandered the Bible. I'm not sure if you remember when he did that. But he slandered the Bible and he basically said, in a mocking way, should we stone our sons if they're not obedient? Should we stone our, our daughters? Should we stone people? And he did it in a very, in a very you know, disparaging, mocking way. And I don't think I'll ever forget it. Uh, of course, like most liberals, it was taken completely out of context, what he said. But I understood, I, understood, I understood what he was doing, I understood, and I understood why he was doing it. But to slander the Word of God is, in my, in my estimation, one of the worst things you can do. Um, and for the leader of a country whose Bible belt consists of over 55 million people at least, uh, to, to openly slander the Bible like that was, was horrible. And like I said, I will not forget it. So, but he did, and much of what he spoke about is from tonight's Torah portion. So we're going to look at some of those hard verses that, that many people use to, to either come, come, come to the conclusion that the Old Testament is no longer relative, or maybe the God of the Old Testament is no longer relative. For many, many centuries, uh, Christianity has sort of pushed aside the God of the Old Testament in favor of the God of the New Testament. Have you ever encountered anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the idea is that the quote-unquote God of the Old Testament had a son who, 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 was sort of, uh, who was sort of given the opportunity to present a kind of gentler God. That God became more, more passive and more, more loving once his son was brought into the world. That's, the, that's sort of the position that many Christians take. And, and to some of us, we've never heard that before, and it sounds a bit odd, but it's absolutely the position that they take. They, they effectively say that because Jesus went to the cross, the God of the Old Testament was completely changed. He changed his demeanor. All right, it's an argument, and the purpose of the argument, I understand. The purpose of the argument is to sort of rationalize why there's such powerful and strong references that we find in the Old Testament, Old Testament, in the Torah, relative to God. But there's something we must remember. Every time we think about Jesus going to the cross and providing the way for a kind of gentler God, we must remember that it was Jesus from the very beginning, in the pre form, that issued the very word of God to Moses. We must understand that. So was Jesus wrong? Did he make a mistake? No. What we're going to see here tonight, and they're very difficult verses to deal with. I'm not going to say no to that. They're very, very heavy verses to deal with. But we must understand that these, and they, they, are, they are context in, in statutes. So we're going to read these statutes, or these commandments, these laws, and... And in reading them in that context, we're going to, we're going to hopefully understand why these, these statutes were given. Strong, heavy statutes. But they were given for a reason. And the reason is, and I'm going to just lay it out right now. The reason is, God had a higher expectation of Israel. So when, when God commissioned his son Yeshua in the pre-incarnated form to interact with Moses, to give his law to Moses to give God his own law through Jesus to Moses, the idea was that Israel would be a people set apart, an arm segula, a peculiar people. And that's the call that Israel has on themselves as a nation. God has called them to be that nation, to be a set apart nation. Now, Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. And sometimes we hear that statement, we make that statement, we, we 
paraphrase the statement, we quote the statement, and we don't quite understand the depth and the strength of that statement, the power behind that statement. To whom much is given, much is required. What is the context under which Jesus said that? Anyone remembers? In what context did he say, to whom much is given, much is required? I'll give someone, someone, someone of you here an exercise. Go find that verse. Pull it up. To whom much is given, much is required. Read in context what it's saying. In the meantime, I'll just keep going. So you would, inter you would interject and tell me the context. I know the context, but you would tell me. So to whom much is given, much is required. Now, this is the story of Israel. Israel was called by God. God said concerning Israel, you are my firstborn. When did God refer to Israel as his firstborn? In, in Egypt. God's very first confrontation of Pharaoh is when he made that statement. You, Israel, you are my firstborn. Well, he said to, to Pharaoh, let my firstborn go. So Israel is God's firstborn. And that says that Israel has, therefore, the responsibility to be an example to whom? To the nations. And this is the, this is the concept of Israel being given much and therefore being required to give much. So the standard for Israel is higher, much, much higher. When you study the Torah, when you look at the first five books of the Bible, you see there that God's expectation of Israel was very high as it related to the surrounding peoples. He did not make these statutes and commandments and demands, okay, there were demands concerning the other nations. He wanted Israel to live to that high standard, to be a vessel through which the other nations can, can behold God's standard. God wanted to represent and present his standard through Israel. What was necessary? Obedience. Now, we've talked about this quite a bit over the past several weeks, and you cannot, let me say this categorically, you cannot escape the whole issue of obedience if you teach the Bible. Now, now you can teach the Bible in a very cherry-picked manner and avoid the issue of obedience. And many people manage to succeed in doing that today. But obedience, the whole concept of obedience, and presenting God as holy because of obedience, it's replete throughout the Bible, not just in the quote-unquote Old Testament. It's also in the New Testament. Jesus himself spoke concerning the importance of obedience. And this is what God wants from his people, from Israel. He wants that from us as well. When in Leviticus, God said, well, Moses said to Israel, God said to Israel through Moses, be holy, Israel, because I am holy. Several weeks ago, we saw an example of what holiness, what holiness really is, where it comes from. Holiness comes as a result of our reverence of God. God is not holy in my life if I don't reverence Him, if I don't obey Him. I treat Him as unholy. Isn't that true? And this is what Moses did. Moses rebelled for a very short period. He rebelled against God. And God said to him, you did not treat me as holy. And there was a consequence for that. Why? Why was there a consequence for one moment of rebellion? Moses effectively slipped up. He had a, he had a soft moment. He slipped. And God held him accountable to that and punished him. Why? Because Moses was given much. Moses was the great high priest, a picture of Yeshua. So much was required of Moses. He did not present God as holy to the people of Israel. Well, Israel itself as a nation has the responsibility of presenting God as holy. And by what means? Through obedience. And that's true for us as well. We cannot escape it. Peter said to the church, or to the churches, be holy as God is holy. Didn't Peter say that in 1 Peter chapter 1? You think, well, that's for Israel only. No, it's for us as well. We also have been given much. I'll say this, Israel as a nation has been given much. We have been given more than Israel. 
What does that mean? That we're accountable for even more. Does that make, does that, does that, does that make sense? Does the, does the math add up? Israel is responsible before all the nations to God for a lot. We in Messiah, we have more to be responsible for because more has been given to us. So obedience is a very important factor with us as well. And what we're going to see here is that God will chastise his people who will rebel against him with Moses. Certainly he did. He wanted Israel to be that picture of holiness. He wanted Israel to be a platform on which he would be presented as holy. And so these statutes and these laws, when we look at them here in a few moments, they're going to strike us. Our humanistic juices are going to boil. Yes, they are. They are. Your, your humanistic juices are going to stir up. But remember God's intent. He is wanting Israel to be an example. He's holding Israel to a high standard for the sake of holiness. So who has a good, a good, uh, a good uh, context for, for that verse? To whom much is given, much is required? That's yes, also in Matthew, but let's read it. Okay. Now he's referring to the parables of the talent, right? In Matthew and in Luke. And what is the consequence of not carrying out your master's bidding? In Matthew, it's eternal damnation. Ooh, that's tough. That's tough. In the context of the parable of the talents that we see in Matthew, and I believe it's in Matthew chapter 24, 25, is it? In the context of that parable, the one who does not bring a return, he experiences outer darkness. And that's when Jesus said, to whom much is given, much is required. That's, that's, that's jolting. I remember when I first started studying the Gospels, I had come to know Jesus, sweet Jesus, me and Jesus. I loved him. I still love him. I had come to this place, you know, what a friend we have in Jesus. You know that song? Brings tears to my eyes even now. What a friend we have. With, and I had that relationship with him. Closeness. But then I began to read the Gospels, and I began to see that this one that I love, my beloved, it's tough on those he loves. Tough. He, his expectation of us is great. He wants us to obey him. That was difficult for me to deal with. It took me a while to come to terms with that fact. And I had to come to, to, come to terms with this reality that Jesus, who loves me, has done so much to bring me into his kingdom, wants me to obey him. Because upon that basis would I glorify him. What did he say to us in Matthew chapter 5 concerning this very thing that I'm talking about? Let's go take a look at it. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to read for you 14 to 16. Here is his expectation of us. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, that, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. God wants us to glorify him. Jesus, his mission is to bring those in him to a place where we can glorify him. And you're not going to glorify him if you're not in obedience to him. So you see, obedience is this incredibly consistent theme that cannot be ignored throughout the Bible. Now, if this irks you, you're going to have a hard time with it because it's consistent everywhere throughout the entire Bible. It's like, it's like that, 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 that barb that we get that cannot come out until we determine that we're going to live with the Bible, or we're going to, to do the right thing. And, and it doesn't leave you. The reality of obedience is, is replete in the Scripture. Even the night before the cross, even the night before the cross, 
You know, the cross is referred to as the passion, his passion. Why? Why is it referred to as his passion? Anyone? I'm not talking about the movie now, the passion. Uh, but him going to the cross, from the very night before the cross to the moment of his death on the cross, it's referred to in some circles uh, as his passion. Why? Anyone? Passion. Yeah. Well, yes, that's true. The night before the cross, we begin to see pouring out from him passion. Compassion for his disciples, but passion to carry out God's work. And he was faithful, and he was faithful unto the cross, and this is his passion. So the night before the cross, he gave this message that's undoubted, undoubtedly his most important message as it relates to us. He gave three messages, primarily the Sermon on the Mount, the Olivet Discourse, and then the, his Passover message. They're all important, but as it relates to us and our, our reaction, our, our way of relating to God, that Passover message was in fact the most important. And you can find that message in John chapter 13 to 17. He begins with his Passover Seder. He's conducting his Seder with his disciples. That's in chapter 13 of John. And he ends with a prayer, which I refer to as the Lord's Prayer. All of John chapter 17 is this prayer. Now in John chapter 14, I want to read for you what he said to his disciples. Very simple, but so profound as it relates to obedience. Verse 23 first, John chapter 14. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. Now that verse is so wonderful and so expandable on many levels, and I'm going to read this again. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. Now, We've been told that Jesus is the Father, the Father is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is the Father, He is the Son, He is Jesus. That's what we've been told. But Jesus is saying something here that contradicts that, isn't He? Isn't He? All right, let's read it again. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. So He's expecting obedience. He's expecting us to obey His word. If you love Him... Uh, that's, that's profound. If you love me, keep my word. And my Father will love him. What's, what's the obvious converse of that? The, the, what, 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 what's the obvious takeaway if we don't love Jesus? Then the Father does not love you. My Father will love him, and we, Jesus and the Father, will come to him and make our abode with him. We'll live with him. Now, there's so much comfort in that verse. And there's a challenge too, isn't there? To hear his word and obey. And if you love Yeshua and you obey his word, he is the word of God. Isn't he the word of God? In the beginning was the word, the word became flesh, and the word dwelt among us, and we knew him, right? So we, we know that he is the word of God, personified in a living being. If you obey him, you love him, the Father will love you, and the Father and the Son will live with you. There's comfort in that. So how many of us in our life, in our times of struggle, in our weaknesses, we need to know that God, is, God and his Son is having their abode with us. How many of us need to know this? Do we ever find ourselves in a place of wanton or, 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 or despair, need, and we just simply need to know that God and His Son, they live with us. Is that, is that something we need? I want to tell you, you might, you might may not want to put your hand up, you might think that you don't need that, but you certainly do. We all need that confirmation, that knowing that the Father and the Son has their abode with us. And when you call on Him, and this is what this is what most, a lot of his message was concerning the Holy Spirit. When you call on him, he answers. 
the comforter, right? Let's, let's back up a little bit in the same chapter, 14. We're going to read 15 and 17. So what comfort do we, do, we, do we derive from that incredible verse that God and his Son will live with us, have their abode with us, if we obey the word of Jesus? Jesus gives the word of God. So his word is God's word that comes through him. He has been commissioned, I will use the word commission, to deliver, to be the vessel of God's word. So when you obey the Son, you obey the Father. Is that true? To obey the Son is to obey the Father. To love the Son is to love the Father. In regards to the Holy Spirit, and we have in our abode. So, so how is it? Let me ask a question. I'm trying to, to, to extract something here. How is it that the Father and the Son will live with us? How is that? How's that? What's the dynamics? What does that look like? Because we have received the Father's Spirit. The Father lives in us by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, because of the Holy Spirit, we have this incredible reality that, we, that God lives with us. The Father and the Son has their abode with us because we have the Holy Spirit. That's pretty simple, right? That's elementary. But it's profound. Don't blink at it. It is absolutely, incredibly profound. Let's read here in John chapter 14 now, 15 to 17. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Again, he's back on the theme there of uh, obedience. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another paracleto. Paraclete. Paracletos, but paraclete. He'll give you another helper, a comforter. This paraclete, this helper, this comforter is the Holy Spirit. So he will give you a Holy Spirit. Let's, let's, the Holy Spirit, let's read. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. Forever. Now that's comforting again, isn't it? That God and his Son will live with you. They will have their abode with you forever because God has given you his Holy Spirit. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. See? So Jesus speaking to his disciples, he's saying, you know the Spirit because you've seen him. When did they see the Holy Spirit? Working through Jesus. They were acclimated in the Holy Spirit. They were they were, they were exposed to the Holy Spirit. They've, they've known the Holy Spirit working through Jesus. And they've, they've known the Spirit working in them, working with them. What did he say? Let's read again. 17. It does not... All right, so let's read all of 17 again. I want to make this point clear. That is the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him, but you know him. How did they know him? Because... They knew Jesus. Did Jesus receive the Holy Spirit without measure? Did he function? Did he minister in the power of the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. So they knew the Spirit of God in Jesus. But you know him because he abides with you. So the Holy Spirit abides with you. But he's talking about a time when the Holy Spirit will be in them. Right? When did that happen? Right. Fifty days or 51 days, following this message, Passover, this Pesach message, the Holy Spirit filled the church and became in them. From that moment on, they, they had this incredible, incredible position where God dwelt with them, in them. And that was forever, forever. If you have the Holy Spirit, that's an eternal gift. <laughs> The gift that keeps on giving, for real. That's an eternal gift. Forever you have this. Now, why did I go off on this incredible diatribe? Because I really, really don't want to deal with the verses here. But I know that I have to, that we find in Deuteronomy. So the whole, the whole point to, to, to the Torah is obedience. God wants Israel to obey him. He wants Israel to, to, to yield to him. 
and glorify him in that state of obedience, right? So let's, let's read some of these statutes. The whole point of this is, again, to deter evil, to glorify God by keeping his law and doing his will. So, remember these are very hard statutes. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 21. <clears throat> I'm going to read 18 to 21. Deuteronomy chapter 21, 18 to 21. The tendency is to avoid these statutes, but I don't. I take, I, I face them, I take them head on, I, I face them down, and I present them. So let's talk about it. 21, 18 to 21. If any man has a stubborn or rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them, then his father and his mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gateway of, the, of, of his hometown. They shall say to the elders of the city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death, and you shall remove evil from your midst, and all of Israel will hear of it and fear. Now, how tough is that? If you have a son, he's a glutton and a drunkard. We know what those are. He's not responsible. He's rebellious. You've, you've, you've attempted to bring him to a place of righteousness, and he refuses. You take him out to the gates of the city, and the elders there will stone him. They will not try him. They will stone him. Now, that's not the God of the Old Testament. That's Jesus. It was Yeshua that gave this law to Moses. Was Moses anointed by the Holy Spirit? What do you think? The same Holy Spirit that fills us, the same comforter, spoke these words to Jesus, to, to, to Moses. So Moses delivered that word. Is it a hard word? Of course. How difficult was it when Peter spoke death to Ananias and Sapphira? We think, oh, this is Old Testament, nothing like that in the New Testament. But how difficult was it when Peter spoke death to Ananias and Sapphira? You've lied to the Holy Spirit, and they both died. It's tough. God wants obedience. And when he positions someone or a people in a place of, of, of potential glory, a place where they can glorify him, he wants us to glorify him. Now, so if I were to take these verses and bring it into a today's context, of course, I'm not going to drag him out in the street and have some people stone him. But if, if, in this case, and I'm going to give you a, 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 a translation or interpretation of how this will work for us today, if you have a son or a daughter, I guess, in that case, who is in that place, persistently rebellious, de you know, de destroying the witness of Messiah, the witness of God, bringing shame to God's word and refuses to repent and has proven that they will not repent, you put them out. You deliver them over to Satan. And that's New Testament context. You deliver them over to Satan. Now, from the standpoint of Israel, they were to stone this child, this, not even a child, perhaps, the reference is there of an adult son. But this person was to, was to be stoned before all of Israel. And for what purpose? So that Israel will see it and fear. Deterrence work. I, I, I don't know if you know that. Deterrence work. I've seen how deterrence have worked in my own life. Deterrence are real. That's why we have a law. That's why we have a judicial system. So that deterrence would be applied in our society and they will bring a sense of order. They're real. 
God wanted Israel to live in this same place because they were called to a higher standard. Not pretty, not attractive. If, if you have to put an adult, an adult child, son or daughter, out into the streets, that's not something any of us want to do. And for most of us, I believe, we will do everything to avoid doing it. We'll give that final chance one more time, but there comes that time when you have to cut them off. And again, give them over to the devil for destruction of the flesh. And that's what Paul spoke about. Not attractive, but it's a reality. Let's also speak concerning the law of adultery that we see here in tonight's Torah portion. In Deuteronomy chapter 22, we're going to read what? 21 and 20, chapter 22, is that right? No. Yeah. Chapter 21, verse 22. Okay, so we understand what adultery is. What, what's the consequence of adultery in today's world? Not much. There was a time when adultery was against the law, where you can actually be penalized by law for committing adultery in this land. Yes, there was a time when that was... I think in some in some cases, adultery is still illegal. That's something you can perhaps research for us. In, in some counties, some states, adultery is still illegal. Isn't it? I think it is. But, but how, how much do we honor people that are not adulterous? Do we dishonor people that are adulterous? Our entire civilization is being molded to, to, to bring people to a place where adultery is normal. So, so you commit adultery, so what? Adultery is a sin against God because it's a, it's a sin against man. It's a sin against ourselves. Adultery is a sin against ourselves. It's destructive. This, listen, it's destructive because adultery will always end in destruction of a family. You might think you can get away with it, slip one by, and you never do it again, but that's not the case. It will catch up with you. It's not, it's not, like, it's not unlike any other sin. It doesn't go away because you no longer do it. Now, you can repent of any sin. Repentance in regards to adultery would involve open repentance. If, you're, if your sin is against your wife, if your adultery is against your wife or your husband, there needs to be repentance. But that repentance has to be, has to be followed by confession. Has to be. God will forgive you. Now, the penalty that we see here for Israel is tough. Let's read it. In chapter 21, verse 22, If a man is found lying with a married woman, then they both shall die. They're both guilty. The man who laid with the woman and the woman, thus you shall purge evil from Israel. What's the point here again? To purge, to remove evil from the camp of Israel. And that certainly applies to us in the context of the church. Absolutely. Adultery will bring sin into the camp and it will eat away at the camp. Even if it's hidden, even if you think you got away with it, it will be discovered and it will have its effect in God's, in God's house. So it's something that has to be dealt with. Now, I don't want to get too far off with this one, Things we've had to deal with in the past, they're in the past, but we've had to deal with such things. And the solutions are never easy. They're always, they're always hard as nails. But you never get away from, from the reality of having to deal with these things. If there is adultery, it has to be stomped out. It cannot be tolerated. And it has to be openly confessed. And that's a difficult one. But from the standpoint of Torah, they're both to be stoned. Mm. 
Let's read on now. now the, the sin of adultery presents again in tonight's Torah portion. Again, the same, the same outcome. Let's read, let's read some more. Chapter 22. You guys had enough already? <laughs> Chapter 22, I'm going to read 28 and 29. Hang on. There's no happy ending to this message. I just want to let you know that right now. It's very tough, but I have to deliver it. Chapter 22, now 28 and 29. If a man finds a girl who is a virgin, who is not engaged, and seizes her and lies with her, and they are discovered, now this is rape. Effectively, this is rape. He seizes her, takes her to be his wife. Now in the ancient world, particularly in the Middle Eastern ancient world, if a young girl was taken in the field, as it says here, she was just taken to be a wife, she was effectively taken against her will. In just about every case, she would surrender after, after the act is committed. Now, the person who took her to be his wife, and this is the act of taking someone to be your wife, uh, has a responsibility. Let's read about this. It's tough. I didn't tell you it wasn't tough. And they are discovered. Then the man who laid with her shall give to, to her father's, give, excuse me, shall give to the girl's father 50 shekels of silver. <sighs> Tough. And she shall become his wife because he has violated her. He cannot divorce her all of his days. So let's put that into a visible context. Tough one. Israeli, he's a farmer. Ancient world, of course, not today. It should apply today, but... It, so he's a farmer. He has crops. He sees his neighbor's daughter. She's of age. I'm not going to tell you how old she is, but she's of age. Things were different in the ancient world. He goes over, he chats with her. He realizes that, 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 he, realizes that he likes her. So what does he do? Against her will or with her will, he takes her to be his wife. Ah, they are discovered. That's tough. They are discovered. Her father walks across the field and sees them. The expectation is that this person who took this, this virgin, this young girl, to be his wife, now he is responsible. And he has to marry her. He has to give some shekels to her father. He has to marry her, but he has no right to ever divorce her. So that statute, even though tough, there's a, there's a hint of God's mercy in it. Because he is never to divorce her for any reason. He's to remain married to her. Now, by our standards today, that cannot be mercy. There's no mercy in this statute, right, from our standard. But keep in mind the context under which we're, the, 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 the societal context under which we're referring to. In the ancient world, this was normal. It was normative for someone to take someone's daughter and marry them. What's the story of, of Jacob and uh, his daughter Dana? Dinah. Shechem, who was the son of the ruler of Shechem, saw her and took her. And when his sons got all bent out of shape and took action, Jacob was upset. Because there was an opportunity of union between Jacob and the ruler of Shechem. And the action they took kind of put an end to that possibility. You see, so they saw things entirely different in the ancient world than we do. But you see, there is that reality that this person who takes this, this, this young woman to be his wife, he has to marry her, and he cannot divorce her. There, in tonight's Torah portion, there are circumstances under which you can divorce. Yes, in tonight's Torah portion. And it says it there. And that's a tough one for those of us that really struggle with the issue of divorce. It says in tonight's Torah portion, if you take a wife and you're not, and this is tough, ladies, don't stone me. Or don't stick your foot out and trip me when I'm walking across it. It says in tonight's Torah portion, I don't want to read it because it's really tough. If a man takes a wife and she's not suitable, she's not suitable, he finds her lacking, he can give her a certificate of divorce. Right here, in the Torah portion. 
And that's hard to deal with. But it's in there. Now, by our standards as Christians, that's unacceptable. Why is it un unacceptable? Because Jesus said to, to the Pharisees, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses told you you can write that certificate of divorce. So for us in Messiah, we shouldn't even consider a certificate of divorce, regardless of how bad the flaws are. She doesn't cook a good um, omelet, doesn't matter. You don't like the way she cooks your steak, get over it. She doesn't wash your clothes the way you like it washed, so what? Do it yourself. That's, in Messiah, we are not to consider divorce in that way at all. In fact, we're not to consider divorce at all in Messiah. For no reason in Christ is divorce something that we should entertain. But Moses, because of the hardness of their hearts, said, write a certificate of divorce. Now, there's mercy in that. There's, uh, the mercy is that she has a certificate. She has something that says, I was legally, I'm not a harlot, I was legally married, and here's my certificate to prove that I'm not a harlot. Again, we're talking about a different world, right? A completely different world. So I'll just keep, I'll just keep digging deeper here, see how far I can get. Now, in Deuteronomy now, chapter 23, it gets a little better, <laughs> not much. Deuteronomy chapter 23 now, 17 and 18, <laughs> doesn't get much better. In fact, it doesn't at all. We know the story of Judah, right? Judah, and perhaps you don't. Judah, the son, one of the sons of Jacob, Israel, he got totally disenfranchised with his brothers. After the situation with, with Joseph, when they wanted to kill him, you know the story, his brothers wanted to kill him. Reuben didn't know what to do. Reuben was the leader of the clan, and he didn't have anything good to say. Um, but, but Judah said, don't kill the lad, but sell him off. Sell him off, and, and then what happened? They sold him into slavery, into Egypt. God had a plan for all of it, right? But the plan was multipurpose and multifaceted because God was also working in Judah right at that time. Because Judah was up to here with his brothers. And God wanted to burn out of Judah something that existed in him. Which is a tendency to just walk away from his family. Which he did. He left the tribes of Israel. And he became a Canaanite. Judah became a Canaanite. He began to worship as a Canaanite. He married into a Canaanite family. He was functioning like a Canaanite. What was he doing? He was practicing occultic practices. He was, taking, uh, he was going into to prostitutes who were occultic prostitutes. They were prostitutes of, of Ishtar. Why did he go into the prostitute of Ishtar? Why did he go into to who he thought was a prostitute? In fact, it, she wasn't a prostitute. She was Tamar, right? Tamar had set him up. But why did he go into her? Because he was a shepherd. And going into the, to the, to the Ishtar, the, the, the occultic prostitute, will help you to gain stronger flock. You will prosper. She's a fertility goddess. So he goes into her, and what happens? We know the rest of the story, right? Suddenly he finds himself in a place where he's being held accountable, and she holds him in that place, and he repents. What happens with Judah? Following his repentance, following, in fact, his being, he being confronted by Tamar, he returns to the tribes of Israel. Because right after that whole story, he's back again with the sons of Israel. Right? So that's the story of Judah. What we're going to see here is that Moses particularly stated to, that you should stay away from the cultic prostitutes, the Ishtars, the fertility goddesses. Stay away from them. Let's read it. In chapter 23 now, 17 and 18, some of you are wondering, how is he going to regain himself following this? Just wait and see. None of the, none of the daughters of Israel shall be a cult prostitute. Not for Israel. Nor shall any of the sons of Israel be a cult prostitute. Wow. What's he talking about? Well, he's referring to the worship of Baal and the worship of Ishtar, where there would be male prostitutes for the worship of Baal 
and female prostitutes for the worship of Ishtar. That's what he's talking about. You shall not bring the hi okay the hire of a, a harlot of, uh, or the wages of a dog into the house of the Lord your God for any votive offering. For both of these are an abomination to the Lord your God. Verse 18 is connected. I'm not going to go into define that, but if you are a cult prostitute, male or female, and that's the means by which you, you have an income, keep that money out. Don't let it be part of your votive offering. Now, what's a votive offering? We talked about this, I think, last week. What is a votive offering? Something that you vow to give. In this Torah portion, it says very clearly also that if you make a vow, carry through the vow. Don't make a vow and not carry through with it. You're better, you're better off not vowing if you're going to make a vow and not carry through with it. But your votive offering, he is basically saying your votive offering, your tithe, your offering, should not come from a place of corrupt money. That's, that's what he's saying. Why? Because it's holy. It's holy unto God. If you've sold a house or a vehicle, and you know very well that that vehicle was basically worthless, but you got it to crank once or twice, and you sold it for $5,000. Someone bought it, but you know it's only worth five hundred dollars because it's going to die in five days. Don't take $500 of that 5000 and give it to God. It's corrupt. That's, I'm, de I'm deducing that from, from what we're seeing here. But if you come upon funds or monies in a questionable way, don't use it as a tithe offering to God. Keep your tithe. Don't bring it into God's house. Don't use it as a votive offering. So it's very clear God wants us to be holy and to conduct ourselves as holy. Then whatever we give is holy. You understand? You can see how I'm deriving that, right? Live holy lives. And if God blesses you, you're able to sell a vehicle and you did it uprightly without any, 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 any you know, schemes, then bring that offering in, your tithe. But not if you're doing it from a place of corruption. And that's what I deduce, that's what I take away from that. Let's keep going. <clears throat> Chapter 24, also in verse 14. I'm going to read verse 14. Now we're going to get a little softer. We're going to deal with how to care for the foreigner, how to care for the, for the poor in the community, the infant. The statutes allow us to, to, to it, it affords us statutes that are there to help the poor, the destitute. All right, so let's read it. Chapter 24, verse 14. I'm going to read verse 14, 17, and 21. <laughs> you shall not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy, when, whether he is one of your countrymen or one of your, of one of your aliens who is in your land in your tongues. Let's read that again. I blotched it up. I've got to increase the strength of my glasses. They go blur on me a lot of times. I almost don't want to do it because, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an effect, right? The more you increase it, the more you have to keep increasing it. So I struggle to increase it, but I really need to do it. So let's read that again. You shall not oppress a hired servant who is, a poor, and, who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your countrymen or one of your aliens who is in your land, in your tongues. So do not, do not impress, oppress someone who is poor and who is needy. A hired person, don't oppress them. Seek their well-being. Now, we have a lot of poor people in this country. Um, there's a whole thing right now about dogs and cats being eaten by people who are impoverished. Well, that's incredibly unfortunate that that came up in the debate. Trump should have never say anything about that. That was kind of out there. Uh, nevertheless, nevertheless, it's true. 
These things are happening. There's no question about it. They are happening. The situation out there in uh, Illinois somewhere, Springfield, Illinois, yeah, is terrible. Our government, for whatever reason, well, we know the reason, but our government has chosen to bring an influx of Haitians and other, other minority, minority peoples from impoverished, country, from impoverished countries into our country and locate them in so-called sanctuary cities. No one voted for that. Not a single person voted for such a thing. Our government has put that on us. Now, is there hardship in Haiti? Yes, absolutely. Things are incredibly difficult in Haiti. And if we as a country were, were, were decent neighbors, we would help Haiti. If we were the people that we should be, we would extend help to the people of Haiti. But bringing them into this country impoverished and unable to, to provide for themselves, we did them no favors. And now there's a huge mess, and the mess is profound. People are going to be discriminated upon. There's going to be violence. It should, have never, it should have never been brought up in the way it was brought up. We're supposed to help people who are, who are not as fortunate as we are. We're supposed to be compassionate. All right, that's what it's saying. Let's read also in, in the same chapter, 24. Let's read in verse 17. Again, same. Well, that backing up a bit. No, we read 17 already. No, I'm in 24. Let's go 25. I'm sorry. 25, we read 17. No. 24, 24, 21. I think I have it right now. No. 24, 21, yes. <laughs> I'm bouncing around here. When you, gather, when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, and you, you shall not go over it again. It shall be for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I am commanding you to do this thing. So verse 21, when you gather your grapes, don't go back over it a second time is what it says. Because a lot of times when you, when you harvest, you harvest the crop that looks really ready, but you leave the crop that's going to be ready in a couple of days. So if you're going through your vineyard, you take the, the grapes, the vines that are really ripe and ready, and you might leave a vine or two that's not ready. Don't go back over it, is what he's saying. Leave it for the people that are impoverished, so that they can come through and harvest for themselves. That's God's law. This is what God expects from us. So what, what are the dynamics working in us that would want to not allow someone to come through and reap our harvest a second time? Greediness. Greed. Greed. Greed will push us to say, nope, sorry, I have at least another good harvest in, in here. I'm not going to let you know. God is saying, let them come into your vineyard and be fed. Be compassionate to people that are impoverished. Now, the United States of America, we are a wealthy nation. I don't know if you know that, but sometimes we feel like we're not. Inflation and the way things are right now in the country, we don't feel like we're a wealthy nation, but we are when you compare ourselves to some of the other nations. There are, the, there are nations out there where, quite literally, pets cannot even be in existence. People cannot have pets. It's just not practical because some pets are food. That's a reality. It is a reality. So we are a prosperous country, and regardless of what our pocketbook says or our, our, our retirement fund says, we should be able to give and be kind to others. This problem with the, with the migrants was, was created for us by our government. Our government has an agenda to flood this country with people from foreign lands and create the conditions under which we would be thrown into, into, into chaos. That's the government's, the government's agenda. That's been going on for a long time. Even though that's true, it shouldn't prevent us from being kind. It shouldn't prevent us from being gracious. We can't look at a Haitian or a Mexican and say, you're here illegally 
and I don't agree with the Democratic Party that, that has allowed you into this country, I am not going to give a thing to you. I don't feel committed to give you anything because I didn't bring you here. You can say that, but it's wrong for a believer. In Messiah, if you're faithful to God anyway, you will have compassion on that person regardless of why they're here, who brought them here, or the grand conspiracy that's hovering over their existence in this country. And yes, there is a grand conspiracy. But we should show compassion nonetheless. So tonight's Torah portion is just packed with all of these high-powered statutes and commandments that really challenges us, right? It kind of forces us to, to do a double standard on God's word. It does. And to a certain extent, you can't get away from it, right? Not, not any of us here will drag our disobedient, rebellious son out into the street and have him stoned by elders. Not one of us will do it. But the principle is active. The principle is there. It's there. Uh, so all of the principles that are being addressed in the Torah portion tonight are real. And for us to, to grapple with and to deal with. And what's the, key, what's the key essential reality here? God wants obedience. He wants his people to live in such a way as to glorify him and to exalt him by obedience. So, the ending of the Torah portion now has to do with Amalek. The people of Molech, right? Amalek, <clears throat> Amalek are the worshippers of Molech. Amalek was one of the sons of Esau. I believe. One of the sons of Esau. And he was a worshipper of Molech, that's what we believe. And the people of Molech are descendants of Esau, but not just descendants of Esau, they were, they were a spiritual demographic. They were not a, a, a actual genetic demographic, they were a spiritual demographic, and they consisted of a, an array of different peoples, as far as we know. Now, what happened with Amalek back in Exodus chapter 17? What was the story with Amalek? Amalek came against the people of Israel. Amalek came against the people of Israel. What did, how did God deal with Amalek? He empowered the people of Israel, the, the, the armies of Israel. This was the first war, the first battle that Israel faced coming out of Egypt before they got to Mount Sinai. Just before they got to Horeb, the rock, and Mount Sinai, Amalek attacked. Amalek's purpose was to discourage Israel from going forward in God's purpose. That was the entire purpose of Amalek. And from the account that we see in Exodus chapter 17, they came close to succeeding. Right? Every time Moses would drop his hand, Amalek would prevail. That's the story. So Moses had the staff in his hand and he held the staff up. Every time his hand became weary and his hand went down, Amalek would prevail. That's not a battle that you want, right? Nevertheless, Aaron and Hur held up the staff of Moses and that brought the victory. Israel, Israel prevailed over Amalek because Aaron and her supported Moses by lifting up his hands and the battle was won. So what do we know about that battle? It's not only physical, it's not only a conventional, natural battle, it's spiritual. The whole nature of the battle is spiritual. Whenever that staff went up, Israel prevailed. The staff went down, Israel was defeated, being defeated. All right. So God said now concerning Amalek in Exodus chapter 17 that he will make war against Amalek from generation to generation because they've put his hand, they've, they've put their hands on his, on his throne. They've interfered with his authority. That's what it says in the Hebrew. That God will make war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, here is, here is Moses now preparing Israel to enter into the land of Israel where they would encounter Amalek. Did Amalek attack Israel? Over and over. So here is, what, here is what we see here now concerning Amalek. 
what was the nature of the attack? What was so hideous about Amalek's attack that God determined that he will make war with Amalek from generation to generation? Strictly speaking, if Amalek is a spiritual demographic, and God said that he will make war with them from generation to generation, then they exist today. And they do. When Balaam spoke his prophecy concerning Israel, he said in, in Numbers chapter 24 that Amalek will be destroyed. Amalek will be the last of the nations, and Amalek will be destroyed. So Amalek is still in existence today. But what did Amalek, the, the people do? How did they approach Israel? Let's read that. It's in tonight's Torah portion, chapter 25, 17 and 18. Remember what Amalek did. Now, to this point, we don't know exactly what they did. But let's, let's see exactly what Amalek did. Remember Amalek? Remember what Amalek did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. How he met you along the way and attacked, attacked among you all the stragglers at your rear. When you were faint and weary. So Israel was weary from the journey. He, he attacks from the rear. He comes from behind, right? Let's finish it up. And he did not fear God. Later on in Deuteronomy, we'll see it. It says that he attacked the women and the children and the infirm. So Amalek came up from behind. When Israel was weary from that journey from, 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 uh, from Goshen to the wilderness of Sin to Horeb, an attack from behind went after the women and the children, the weak and the infirm. And that's why God said he would make war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now, <clears throat> Amalek existed west of the Jordan River, south in the Negev, east of what we call Gaza today. The people of Amalek, that, that was their territory. East of Gaza, just, just way south of, of uh, Jerusalem, down there in the Negev. Now, the attack that Israel suffered back last October, October 7, was very much Amalek. The spirit of Amalek. Not necessarily the same people, not necessarily the actual, you know, ge genetic demographic, but spiritually, it was Amalek. Now, most of us recognize it within hours of the attack. How did we, why did we recognize Amalek? because of the nature of the attack. They went after the weak. They came up from behind, literally. Israel was celebrating their most holy day, something that was honored many times in the past by even the Muslims. So Israel was celebrating their holy day, and this, this Amalek came up from behind, literally, and began to attack the women and the children, the stragglers, the weak. Literally, literally, Israel was weary last October. Why? Because of all the years of Intifada. All the incredible years of Intifada, Donald Trump gave them the hope of an of a Abrahamic Accord, which was a farce. There was no hope in it at all. He gave Israel the false hope that things will be good. We can make peace with the Arabs. Didn't happen. And when Israel did not expect it, Amalek came up and attacked from the rear and went after the weak. What did God say about Amalek? He would make war with Amalek from generation to generation. He said to Israel, you must blot out Amalek, destroy Amalek completely. Do not allow Amalek to exist. You know the story of Shaul, Saul, what happened? He didn't obey God's word concerning Amalek and God judged him eternally judged Saul because Saul was timid about destroying Amalek. So God, God is serious about Amalek. He wants Amalek destroyed. Amalek came against Israel last October, October 7th. What has happened to Amalek since then? Israel is following after God's word. The word concerning Amalek is to completely destroy them. And Amalek is being destroyed. 
Is it attractive? Is it pretty? Should we do a victory dance over it? No. We don't like it. I don't like it. But it's absolutely necessary. It has to happen. This Amalek has to be destroyed and will be destroyed. Again, when Balaam prophesied concerning Israel, in Numbers chapter 24, he said it. In the end, Amalek will be destroyed. So it's a spiritual demographic. Now, I'm going to ask a question. The Gazans, so-called Palestinians, they're not Palestinians. The Gazans. Did they vote for Amalek? Yep. Could a Gazan, an individual Gazan, choose to not be a part of it? It's going to be difficult. He's going to have to literally walk away from the masses. It's going to be tough. Pretty much impossible, close to it, for an individual Gazan, so-called Palestinian, to say, I want nothing to do with this. I am not going to vote for you guys. I'm not going to support you. I'm going that way. It might seem impossible, but it's not. Many have done it. Many have done it. Many have turned away from, from Amalek within the context of Gaza, the Hamas. Many have. And, and from my point of view, I'm, I'm going to put this out here for you. If I, and I, I don't like these hypotheticals, but if I was a Gazan, so-called Palestinian, and I came to the realization, someone, someone gave me a Bible, and I came to the realization that, wow, God has a bit of a, a problem with us. He loves his people, Israel, and he made this statement about Amalek, and I can identify Amalek in us. I'm not going to be a part of it. I would head east or north. I will get out of there. And you know what? If it costs me my life, so be it. I will not stand with the armies that are working against God and his people. I will do what it takes to get away. And even if I don't make it out of there, I'm not going to go down with Amalek. I'm not going to be a part of that destruction. I'm not going to find myself fighting against the armies of Israel, fighting against God. Now, what I just said is a reality that we must all face. We don't live in Gaza. We haven't voted in for Amalek. But the truth is we do. We live in a global Gaza and we are voting in a global Amalek. Amalek is very active in our government. Amalek is right here and now, all around us. Our opportunity to say no to Amalek and to walk away from it is right before us. Are we going to allow the system to pull us in, to deceive us? You know what the angel herald in Revelation chapter 18, come out of her, Babylon, Amalek, come out of her, do not partake in her destruction. So just as the Gazan has an opportunity to come out of, of that Babylon, that Amalek, we have that opportunity as well. It's a, it's a bit different but it's just as powerful. The time will come, and, and I don't want to end on this, this, this strong note, but the time will come when we will have to make that decision, like that Gazan. Am I going to be a part of this global Amalek? Am I going to take the mark of the beast? Am I going to vote this Babylon into position? Or am I going to obey the word of the angel who heralded and said, come out of her? Don't take part in her destruction. I know what my response would be. I would not give up my eternal soul for the sake of a few more peaceful years. Peaceful. I will not yield to evil 
because it promises something better for the future. No. We must all take, take a hard stand. We must all make the hard decisions, and it's there for us as well. If you support, if you support the work that God is doing in the earth today concerning Israel, if you stand with Israel, be prepared to be put in a place where you will have to make such a decision. Now, I know for a fact, and I'm going to end now, that there are many Gazans who are coming to terms with Jesus. It's happening. We've been praying for it here a long time. On Wednesday nights, we've been interceding. We've been crashing the gates of heaven. We've been standing on the walls. We've been giving God no rest. We've been taking no rest for ourselves. We've been interceding. And a lot of times, most of the times, that comes up. That reality that God made the Palestinians come to know your son. The reports that we're getting are profound. They're having dreams. They're having visions. They're seeing visions. They're, 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 Jesus is speaking to them in dreams and visions. That's happening. The Israelis are beginning to recognize that this is happening. Jonathan, uh, what's his name? Last name, Jonathan. Negative. Um, Jonathan, who was going to come here and speak with us? Feldstein. Feldstein, that's right. Jonathan Feldstein, who, who's been here before, and his organization really works to connect, connect uh, Israeli organizations with Christian organizations. He wanted to come here, but his schedule won't allow him to come here. He wanted to come here and talk to us about what's happening in Gaza, how these Muslims are coming to Jesus and they're becoming supporters of Israel. Now, I've seen that in a vision. Not a, not a, not a visual vision, but in a, in a heart's vision. I've seen that. I know it's happening. I know it's going to happen more and more. In Ramallah, in Jenin, in Nablus, in the Gaza, God has a great plan. And he's going to use the very people of Amalek to reach out to Israel, to minister to Israel. That's going to happen in Christ. Jonathan Feldstein said it. He said that. That's exciting. That's incredibly exciting. That some are turning away from Amalek. So tonight's Torah portion, tough as nails. Dealing with this, like trying to pry nails with your bare hands, I don't like it, but it's important for us to understand that God wants obedience from us, not just those stiff-necked Jews, but God wants obedience from us. He wants us to make hard decisions about being faithful to him and being prepared to glorify him, even if it means that you're going to have a difficult time. And I hate to tell you this, but things are being set up in this country right now for us to have a difficult time. Now you can stick your head in the sand, you can pretend it's not happening, you can turn the blind eye and just whistle past the graveyard. Yeah, you can do that. It's not going to do much for you. <laughs> it's happening. It's unfolding. So what do you do? You square your shoulders. You plant your feet. And you say... I'm not going to yield to evil. I'm not going to stay in this Amalek, this Babylon. I'm going to come out of her. That's what you do. You commit yourself to it. I venture to say that God will honor you. He will keep you. And to the extent that you're willing to be his vessel during this time, he will use you. I, I, I'm convinced of it. Shabbat Shalom.